Okay, so we're on the last uh, part of our It's All About Jesus series. Um, this is our rescue appropriately for today in the resurrection and that he rescued us. Uh, and today we're looking at um, this rescue. Uh, particularly, there's a particular point we're going to be looking at uh, in the verses. We're going to go through one verse today, but we'll use other verses to show you what it what Jesus is saying. Uh, and specifically what we're looking at is the promise uh, made to his disciples uh, in comforting them uh, when they seemingly were troubled when they uh, Jesus knew that they felt troubled by what was happening and so he comforts them uh, and so for us as we observe Easter as a reminder of the cross the death of Jesus the resurrection I think this will serve as a reminder and encouragement for us that whatever happens here whatever uh, we are faced with there is one unshakable truth that cannot be changed by anyone or by any means or by any schemes one day we will be with jesus forever that is unchangeable so we're going to look at four things uh, it's the person the promise the people the place and they're all aligned with one piece of scripture uh, and it's it's this one here if i go it's john 14 verse 3 if i go and prepare a place for you I will come back, take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. So we're going to look at this first one, which is uh, the person. And really all we're looking at is the I in this verse, uh, which is about Jesus. We're going to start with Jesus himself in relation to the rescue that he has provided for us. Uh, and what we're going to try and understand is uh, who is Jesus, because even if you're a Christian and you've been a Christian forever long, uh, you still will not fully know Jesus. Uh, you know Jesus to believe in him, to have your salvation. Uh, but actually, uh, we won't really know fully until we get there. Uh, there is, we don't know why he gave his life for us. Why would he really do that? We don't know that fully why he would give his life for us. We don't deserve his life. We don't deserve the sacrifice. But my hope, and I think this is true, this is what I can read in the Bible, is that we will be full of knowledge of God in the sense we know for sure everything that we need to know when we are there. Uh, but there are some things, as the Bible says, are hidden from us at this time. So there is never a time when we say, I, I know Jesus, you don't need to tell me any more about him. Uh, we need to keep looking at the scriptures and say, what more can we learn about Jesus as the Holy Spirit teaches us more about him? So who is Jesus? What do his followers say about him? Let's look at this verse to help us. Colossians 2 verse 9. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So, not to sound like a broken record, but once again, uh, we arrive at the most important principle and facts of who Jesus is. The book of Colossians say that God lives in Jesus Christ. And of course... That is to say that Jesus is God. The context of this particular section of Scripture comes after the verse that warns us to avoid being taken by deceptive and empty philosophies that are of human making and its principles. The completeness of Jesus and our connection with him shows other philosophies and traditions are unnecessary. Since all the fullness of God, of the Godhead, dwells in Jesus. He cannot be halfway God or a sub-God. He is God. The context, uh, certainly historically, of, of this writing uh, was that the false teaching among the Colossian Christians was something like an early form of Gnosticism uh, and that they were heresies coming through. So this letter is for the purpose of warning the Colossians to stay away, and particularly this is aimed at them for that purpose. These heresies uh, made a sort of radical separation between the spiritual and material. So Paul needed to make it clear that all the fullness of the Godhead was in Jesus bodily, but not in the same, in, the, in some strange mystical sense. What they used to do was effectively separate the spiritual and then the actual Jesus, in the sense. Uh, that's where we get New Ageism, so Gnosticism, 
we get new ageism, which is that we, we go all into the spiritual and then we don't really acknowledge, or people in the new age sort of belief don't acknowledge that Jesus is God. They, 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 as they, we saw here in Colossians, we see here as you read it, if you go away and read it, you'll find that there's a, there is a separation that they're trying to be told. You don't need to believe that Jesus is God. Instead, just go for the spiritual. Here's the spiritual stuff. Here's the man. Here's the, they're all separate things. They're not. What Paul is doing here is warning them. The person of Jesus, the fullness of God, was in Jesus bodily uh, and not in, as he said, some strange mystical sense. This we can see in 1 John 4, 2 to 3. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Verse 3, but every spirit does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. I mean, he literally just turned the, the statement around and said the opposite is not true. It's not God if it's not acknowledging that Jesus is not from God. Uh, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. So it's not just rumours. It's not just some uh, particular belief system. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming and even now is already in the world. What he's doing is trying to tell people, or tempt people at least, into believing that the, the spirits that say or don't acknowledge that Jesus is from God are okay to believe in. He's warning them here, he's saying, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. There's a very simple way that Christians can measure this. We pray in the Holy Spirit, we ask God to guide us, and every spirit that doesn't align, or every word, as it were, we might get some sort of uh, uh, message, I would say. M maybe message is not the right word, but certainly um, indication from God. Some word, it must align with Scripture. If in that spirit it does not acknowledge Jesus is from God, then it's not from God. More so, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, not just confusion, it's from the Antichrist himself, the devil, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Hence why we struggle with sharing the gospel. Antichrist is operating. He's trying to whisper to people, it's not true that Jesus is God. It's not true that he gave his life for you. It's not true that he died on the cross. It's not true that he was resurrected. That's what they're trying to say. That's why they're trying to be tempted uh, to people. There was a teaching in the early church that claimed, uh, even so, that Jesus had no actual human body. But that he only seemed to have a, uh, sorry, have a human body. There was no other part of him. He was just human. Another said that Jesus, the man, was separate from different uh, and different from the spirit of Christ. This was early church stuff. See why these letters were written uh, in Colossians. We can see why Paul wrote to the Corinthians, there's a lot of warnings to be heeded constantly, is the reminder that you must believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is God. And time and again, Scripture makes clear that Jesus is God. And this is why these verses are needed. This is why we need to study the Word. We need to know that whilst there are some very obvious errors in the early church in the way Jesus was perceived, there is also some slight modifications that we need to be aware of, that people will say the right things. There's a common, uh, a common, let me say, common trick that people use when preachers who are not really preaching the gospel, what they'll do, they say all the right godly words to begin with, and they get you engaged, and then they say something that is not scriptural at all. So, see what happens? So what they say is they will say all the right words about Jesus. Jesus is this. Jesus is great. Jesus is awesome. All good stuff. They reel people in. And then when they've got them, they then don't talk about Jesus. They don't talk about the Bible. They don't even quote scripture, which I find astounding. There's all these little modifications of the way certain heretical preaching is done that tries to get people tempted into believing that they are speaking from the Bible. And... We can test that against the word. We are each responsible for knowing the person of Jesus Christ. That is through the word. So when someone speaks to us, someone comes to try and what, what might seem like someone comes alongside us and we agree with them and they agree with us, 
be very careful where that conversation goes. Sometimes it can go into these weird Gnostic New Age type conversations. Be very careful. And that is the warning of the Bible. And that hasn't stopped today. We still need to be very aware of these little tricks, these slight modifications that dress up at deeper theological errors, such as the denial that Jesus is God. Be very careful. So we need to know who he is according to the Bible, not man's philosophical ideas and whimsical thoughts. Even more dangerous is the suggestion that the spirit of the Antichrist is present and spreads the lie that Jesus is not God. That is something to be very aware of. He continues to operate as he did, just as he did in the Garden of Eden. He will keep asking the questions, putting doubt into people's minds. You don't even have to go very far, sadly, on YouTube or other places where you'll find churches preaching, a, unfortunately, a false doctrine that Jesus is not God. It is extremely sad, but also quite terrifying. It is very black and white that Jesus, that we must believe that Jesus is God. Otherwise, we are not of God. We are not Christian. We are not believing in the biblical Jesus. So it's important only to know Jesus as our saviour, but also to know who Jesus, according to the word, is. So that we do not build that hope of salvation on falsehoods. So many people in the Christian faith have walked away. My worry about that is that the reason why they may have walked away is because they haven't had a solid grounding in understanding why they believed in the first place. We must be upfront and truthful about who Jesus is, that he is God, that he came to die for sin, that we are sinful people in need of a saviour. That message is hard to hear, especially in this day and age. Hebrews 1, sorry, Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. There again, a simple truth. Jesus is God. Let's move to this next part, the promise. <clears throat> and this part is really simply, I will come again or I will come back. Uh, in our reading of John 14, verse 3. This promise that Jesus is going to return is for many people one of fantasy for non-believers. To think that Jesus will come back is very difficult to believe. To the extent that just as in our day, it was the same in Peter's day, that people make fun of this concept that Jesus will return one day. 2 Peter 3, verse 3 to 4. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing, following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. What is Peter saying there? He's saying, just as God had promised his son when he died on the cross and rose again, don't bet against him next time. Because next time he's not coming in grace. He's not coming in as a, as a wounded Jesus, as it were. He's coming back in strength and power. Revelation shows us quite clearly that what we get is a lion. What we get is a powerful Jesus, one who is coming to finish the work. So as Christians, we should not be surprised to find that there are those who scoff at the idea of Jesus coming again. As we see here, Peter told us that the scoffers will come. And this is the first thing we need to know. And of course, we can't go without a quote from Spurgeon. Every time a blasphemer opens his mouth to deny the truth of revelation, he will help to confirm us in our conviction of the very truth which he denies. That, that's what should happen when, and that's why we get the first warning, okay, about, about these heresies that we're told. When someone tells us it's not true, it should strengthen our resolve to believe it is true. That makes sense? 
the Holy Ghost told us by the pen of Peter that it would be so. And now we see how truly he wrote. The last days, as the Bible refers to, as Peter refers to, are, are happening now. It's not necessarily Revelation days, but the last days is, is since Jesus rose again, since Jesus ascended to the Father. Now we're in the last days, a long period. So I don't particularly mean Revelation, but I don't think Peter is also exclusively referring to Revelation itself but ever since Jesus ascended. And so we're kind of walking in waiting. We're walking in the, in the commands of Jesus. We're doing what Jesus commands us in as best as we can do. And we do the work in these days in his name, but we're also ready to, to as and when, God calls us to go, to get ready for when he returns. But in these last days, before that happens, we will continue to face scoffers who both find it problematic to accept God, both intellectually, but they can't even accept God at a moral level. This is what Peter is talking about. This is a desire to walk in our own lusts and not accept Jesus' lordship over our lives. The scoffers, as Peter says, base their message on the idea that things have always been the way they are right now, and that God has not, and we will not do anything new in his plan for creation. And yet, how much evidence do you need? He has done it once, he will do it again. We already know that throughout Jewish history, and into the prophecies of Jesus' time on earth, on the cross and the resurrection, these things have been foretold and have already come to pass. And yet, in some ways, it's no surprise to see people not believe evidence. In fact, I would argue that in these more recent years, due to certain people that rely on falsehoods and lies, it has only got worse. People don't want to accept evidence anymore. Don't want to accept fact anymore. The only evidence of fact is what they create in themselves. Peter's speaking both there and now. So it's not that the promise of Jesus' return is weak or unbelievable, or that there's not enough evidence. It is simply and plainly this, that the sinful nature of man continues to enjoy thumbing his nose at God every day. Because in this world and in this flesh, that's what makes people feel good. I just want to feel good. And you know what? Sin is, sin feels good, church. It's, it's why we have to be very, very solid in the word, because sin feels good. And I mean any scale of sin you want to talk about. That's why it's tempting. It wouldn't be tempting otherwise. It's the fact that sinful man continues to rebel. It makes us feel, makes people feel good. It makes people feel superior. It gives them the illusion of control over their lives. Proverbs 21 uh, verse 24 says, The proud and arrogant person, mocker is his name, behaves with insolent fury. How relevant is that today? We've seen people that are just so against God's word, against his way, his salvation for them. They'll be furious. They base everything on... Uh, nothing to do with evidence or facts, but everything to do with pride and arrogance. We must pray continually for ourselves, for those also whose minds are blinding or been blinded by the God of this world, Satan. We must pray that we ourselves do not fall into these human delusions of grandeur and pride, 
Jesus is coming. It proved it once. He will prove it again. And what happens then when you accept Jesus? What happens when you finally give in to the evidence that is presented in front of you? When you finally give in to the, the, the tempting, as it were, the good tempting of the Holy Spirit and say, yeah, I'm useless, I'm sinful, I need help, I need redemption. What does he promise? He says, I will take you to myself. In this translation, take you to be with me. So we're looking at the people. Jesus promised that when he comes again, we will be taken with him. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not receive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What's Paul saying here? Paul wanted the Thessalonians to know that those who are asleep, Christians who have died before he returns, will by no means be at a disadvantage. People who believe in Jesus who are not with us now are of no disadvantage compared to us. They will meet him. Those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede them. God will allow those who are asleep to share in the glory of the coming Lord. So comforting. And ending on that verse 18, therefore encourage one another. All of God's people, whether with us today or during the time of revelation, or who have gone before us, will all be taken to the Lord. When Jesus comes... He will come personally. The Lord himself will, will descend and come with a shout. The ancient Greek word for shout is the same word used for the commands that a ship captain makes to his rowers or commander speaking to his uh, soldiers. It's so loud and so very clear. I don't know if you've heard... Uh, people on the marching grounds in Woolwich, and if you've heard them, they are so loud when they're ordering the soldiers, the, the, pe the, the guys that are marching around and doing the different parades and things like that. They're so loud, even uh, when they're doing the, uh, the maybe the uh, change of guard, I think it is, and things like that. So loud is their voice, so clear that it's them, that they know who they're following. They know who to listen for. They listen to their commander. There is an indication that when Jesus comes to take his people, there might well be an audible sound or sounds. At the very least, what we know is that whatever the sound is, only Christians will recognize the sound. When Paul heard the heavenly voice on the road to Damascus, his companions heard the voice, heard the sound of a voice, but they did not hear the articulate words that were said. They heard a sound but did not understand its meaning. Acts 22 verse 9, my companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. Jesus says the same in John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them and they follow me. So when we say, when we've been talking about in Revelation, you'll know when this time comes, you'll know when Jesus returns, because it would be not only so audible, it would be so clear it's him. That if we know Jesus, because we're studying the word and we know who he is through the word, we'll know it's him. No imposter will be able to replicate his calling, his shout. Jesus knows those that follow him. And conversely, believers are able to listen and know Jesus' voice. 
one of the criminals uh, on the cross, as you may remember, next to Jesus, also knew that he was God and believed in him. <clears throat> and when he did, Jesus promised him life eternal with him. Luke 23, 39 to 43. One of the criminals who hung there held insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's amazing, isn't it? I know people often use this when they're talking about baptism and they say, oh, well, look, the, the criminal on the cross, he was able just to say, uh, Jesus, I want to come with you. I believe in you that you're God. That's not the purpose of this verse here to debate about baptism. We're talking about someone believing that the guy on the cross that's next to him is not only Jesus Christ, but he is God himself. He says, rebukes the other criminal and says, don't you know who this is? And what do we see in this pattern in these verses? It started with a scoffer. Someone who was taking the mickey out of Jesus. Someone who was, I don't know, maybe he was serious. Maybe he wanted, of course he wanted to get down, but there's mocking there. That's why he's being rebuked by the other criminal. But for the scoffer, he's lost this eternal life. But for the one who, who rebuked, the one who accepted Jesus as God, he was allowed into paradise for eternity with Jesus. His sheep know his voice and he knows us. He knows, he knew that that criminal knew him. And so Jesus knows him. He recognized Jesus as God. He knew the power of what was going on. He knew in that very short statement, this man does not deserve this. He's done nothing wrong. That criminal managed to encapsulate the entire gospel in that one statement. Did not deserve death when we deserved it. Did not deserve to die when we deserved it. So those alive and remaining until this coming of Jesus uh, caught up to meet Jesus in the air, together with the dead in Jesus, who have already risen. In the ancient Greek, the phrase to, to meet uh, was used as a technical term to describe the official welcoming of honoured guests. This same word is used. Honoured guests. How are we honoured? Not because you're anything special. Not because I'm anything special. Because Jesus is special. And because of Jesus' death and resurrection, it says, you are honoured guests because of me. You are welcomed into the kingdom, not just as a queue of people walking through a door. Every single person is an honoured guest into the kingdom of heaven. Paul's statement under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is dramatic and fantastic. He speaks of Christians flying upward, caught in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we wouldn't believe this unless the Bible told us it was so. Maybe not any more than we would believe that God who became a baby, that did miracles, that died on a cross, that he lives in us. The proof is already there that Jesus is coming back. The way in which Jesus will gather us to himself is absolutely impressive. But really the main point is that whatever the state of the Christians, dead or alive, at the Lord's coming they will always be with the Lord. This is the great reward of heaven, to be with Jesus. Death can't break our unity with Jesus or with other Christians. Spurgeon says this, we shall be so with him as to have no sin to becloud our view of him 
the understanding will be delivered from all the injury which sin has wrought in it, and we shall know him even as we are known. We will be cleansed of all sin. We'll be in presence of Jesus Christ in our perfect new bodies without blemish as Jesus has provided that same way. And so where is this place? What is this place? He says here, that you also may be where I am. Is it an actual place? We, we sometimes get caught up in the imagery, it is right, that there is imagery about heaven. But I, I don't even think that even looking at Revelation, uh, because we're still trying to hear, hear from human words, as it were, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by the Holy Spirit, but we're getting a vision being described to us. And that doesn't, it won't be enough until we get there. We won't really know what it's like until we are there. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also uh, will appear with him in glory. That, you know that, that term when it says in glory? It means it's done. All, all, these, all these bodies that seem to just fall apart, no more of that, made perfect again in the presence of a sinless, perfect God. So right now, Jesus is seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father. When the criminal on the cross gave his life to Jesus, he also believed that it was more than just being relieved of his pain. It was more than that. Relieved of his crime, it was more than that. But that he would also end up with Jesus in heaven. He wasn't just trying to find a quick get out. He was very aware of what was coming to him after he was going to die. He said, I want to go to that other place, hell. I want to be with my Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He just simply said, Jesus, I believe in you. Take me with you. And what did Jesus say? Yes, I'll see you there. Because we know that Jesus is really raised from the dead, then our identification with him becomes real. It is only because we were raised with Christ that we can seek those things which are above. After his resurrection, Jesus looked forward to heaven, knowing he would soon be with the Father. So should we. We should recognize, as I constantly say, that our citizenship, where we live, is in the other place in heaven. We are temporary visitors to this place on earth. The picture of Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father is, is there to keep us encouraged, to move us onward. As we fix our minds on this picture of heaven, but as a reality awaiting us. The promise of the return of Jesus is not only that we will see his glory, but so that we also appear with him in the glory. As we did in our series in Revelation, the place that is described in the most detail in the book uh, is the place where the criminal is. He is forgiven. He is a new body. He is with Jesus. It is where Christians who are no longer with us are and where we will be. It is not a state of mind. It is not an imagination time. This stuff is real. The Bible says so. And God graciously proved that to be the case when he sent his actual son, who is actually God, to actually die on a cross, to actually be buried, to actually be resurrected. When he actually did that, it was a sign of what was to come in the last days. He's going to do this again for one last time. The place described all over the Bible actually exists. In those religions that speak of an afterlife, and what little I know about them, I know this, 
that most other so-called afterlifes that we see in other religions has one particular hallmark and standout difference from the Christian God and his heavenly place. Those other so-called places all seem to have things that speak to the desire of the earthly human. Isn't that so strange? Hinduism says the individual determines the form of his or her next earthly incarnation. I don't know about you, church, but when I when I'm when I'm when God's when I'm looking for something more than this life, when I, I'm curious, you know what I don't want? I don't want to come back here. When I'm done, I don't want to come back to this place. I don't want to be a fish, I don't want to be a cat, I don't want to be a dog. I want to be with my saviour in heaven. Because it doesn't make sense. Islam works on a work-based principle to earn your way into paradise. The description of this place is focused on comfort of the person. Couches, cushions, carpets. Why do you care? You're in the presence of God. Paradise apparently will be adorned with gold and silk for us. They'll be the most comfortable and luxurious of spaces for all of eternity. What a waste of time, I'm sorry to say. I don't want just better things up there that you can get here. I want something else. I want heaven. I want, I want the place that's not this place. The place known as heaven under the Christian God is focused on the worship of God. Not primarily the comfort of the beings who are there. The very few mentions of what people look like in heaven is that we, we see the elders who have crowns. But who has the best crown? Jesus has the best crown. I don't have a great seat and a great throne. Jesus has the best throne. Our comfort as believers in Jesus is that we'll spend eternity with him. And that's it. Do you need a comfy cushion to sit on? Do you need a bean bag? I don't think so. It seems a waste of time to me. I'm going to have a new body. I don't know what that looks like. I don't think I'll be standing up. I, don't, I won't get tired. I won't, I won't be in a, a, a crooked, reckless being of body anymore. I'll be aligned in the glory of Jesus and I want to worship him. Sorry, church, those other things are a waste of time. I don't want more better things from here to there. I want a different thing there. And that's what the Bible promises. It's not that we'll have a comfortable place to sit or enjoy the treasures of the earth. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. And yet everything else talks of human hands. Oh, look how great it looks. Look at the great cushions and couches. Look at the great chairs and the nice windows. Oh, you know, the only reference that we find is when he says, uh, in my father's house, there are many rooms. Do you know what I'm not going to go into? What's my room look like, Jesus? What's my room look like? Have I, have I got a view over the sea? Have I, have I got a beach view, Jesus? That's not what that's about. You'll have a place in heaven. That's what Jesus is talking about. You won't care about the comforts that you care about now. The comfort level in, in heaven will be off the scale, off the chart. You won't care what the fabric looks like. You won't care about the colour of the walls. So that is the assurance of a real place in heaven waiting for us. The place that is not built for our luxury or splendour. But it all points to and is built for him. In that place, we've been invited into Jesus' place. Jesus' home. The heaven that is spoken about. It is not ours. We've been invited into it by his grace. 
How dare we even presume that God's going to sort us out in heaven and put some nice chairs out. He's, it's for him. It worships him all the time. Every day, right now, as we sit here, heaven is worshipping him. The angels are worshipping him right now as we speak. We've been invited into and through the only way. Salvation through Jesus Christ. While a Christian might have some trepidation about facing the unknown, we do not need to fear what is beyond this life and the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus has promised us a heavenly home that we will share with him for all eternity. The entire focus of heaven is being reunited with Jesus. Heaven is heaven not because of streets of gold or pearly gates or even the presence of angels. Heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. Full stop. So today, take comfort. Even as he prepares a place for us, he prepares us for that place. We are being readied for that place which is already established, which is already perfect. And right now he is working in us, getting us ready to be ready for that place. His departure would be for our advantage, since he was going away to prepare a heavenly home for us and will return to take us so that we may be with him. Christians all over the world are eagerly waiting the time when we can go and be with Jesus. Jesus is preparing that place for us right now. And when God the Father says the time is right, Jesus will be coming back to get us. So that where he is, there we may be also. Let's pray. We'll have some worship time and then we'll do communion together.